She's from Springs, um, and the uh, piece is called Why the East End is a Good Place to Die. <clears throat> So that's actually the subtitle of the piece that appeared in the paper. And the way I titled it originally, which was kind of a long title, was What I Learned About Death from the Handsomest Man in Springs and Why the East End is a Good Place to Die. <laughs> I learned from the handsomest man who ever died that death is not what we, the living, think it is and that we can choose not to suffer while dying. My husband never chose to suffer about anything. He liked to be comfy. If my adorable husband, who died, but not to me, at our home on Fireplace Road on May 24th, had been able to read the title of this piece, he would have said, with his usual wit, that he wanted countrywide acclaim for his handsomeness. But this entry, I would have explained, laughing, needed to be about the specific East End to satisfy the requirements of the contest. And he would have understood. He also understood that since I believed I was terminal my whole life, I could be an excellent support for him. Our foray into the diagnostics of dread and doom had resulted in two top Manhattan neurologists guaranteeing that Jim's condition was progressive and irreversible. He did have ALS, they said. He wanted to abbreviate his interval of decline. I didn't want to be apart from him, so I decided we would romantically check out together. We considered carbon monoxide. We envisioned, envisioned the engine of one of our vehicles running until someone drove down the road the passing driver assuming we were getting ready to pull out of the driveway while we drooped, deceased, inside until someone else, perhaps the LIPA man checking the meter, noticed that there was a hose from the exhaust pipe tucked into one of our windows. Not only would this be traumatically horrifying to our discoverer, the equally important veto was based on the fear that I might stop breathing first, and Jim would be helpless, incapacitated, alone. Our garden, however, held some hope. I knew that we had some lethal perennials, so toxic that even the deer wouldn't eat them. Foxglove slows the heart radically enough to kill. Aconite is the queen of poisons, accelerating the heart fatally. Jim, ever practical, Notice that unless one knows exactly the way to administer such substances, we might both wind up at Southampton Hospital blind with enormous headaches, but nowhere near deceased. Not good. Also not good if the plant poisons worked, but I died first again. Then who would take care of him in this vulnerable condition? He would really have rather died than have a stranger take care of him. Here was a man who would rather die, seriously, than go to a dinner party. <laughs> the illness had begun a year before, with weakness in one leg, then a dropped foot that flopped around. Then it was the other leg. Then the abdominal muscles stopped working so he couldn't sit up by himself, and he could not put on his own socks. When the progressing neurologic and neurologic and muscular decline raced upward to his hands and arms he had had it. He was a painter, an artist, a fisherman, a gizmologist who loved to make things and he could no longer hold even a pencil or a piece of popcorn, much less a brush. I knew he would die of terminal boredom before his breathing was impeded and swallowing became impossible. I knew he would resist feeding tubes and breathing apparatus. We discovered quite serendipitously, unless you are a believer and then would say it was God intervening, an organization called Compassion and Choices, which counsels people over the telephone on legal end of life management. They coached us about how and when to involve hospice 
and the methods that could be utilized to help Jim swim with the tide only faster, while at the same time remaining comfortable. This appealed. It was, ironically, life-saving to find a deaf coach. The morning the hospice nurse and social worker from East End Hospice were scheduled to pay us a, quote, informational visit, I wheeled Jim to the sink so he could shave and ready himself. He looked at himself in the mirror and he turned to me and said, I look too good for hospice. They might reject me and not be willing to help. I'm not going to shave. I can look more stubbly that way. Remember how handsome he was. His blue eyes, on forms asking for eye color, he would always write compassionate blue, were sparkling. His complexion was rosy. His silky silver hair sprung gorgeously from his head and feathered down the back of his neck curling around his ears charmingly, as always. He was wearing a black Armani t-shirt that morning. He said, get me a white t-shirt and some coffee. I did. He spilled the coffee down the front of the t-shirt so that he'd look like one of those men in the Price cartoons in The New Yorker, with the bare light bulbs hanging over a disordered table <coughs> upon which sat a scary looking cat. Then he asked me for some flour, which he sprinkled all over his black cotton Puma sweatpants. He looked quite schlumpy and waited for the hospice people in a wheelchair instead of sitting on the sofa. The hospice nurse and social worker spoke with us, sorry for the sticky paper, spoke with us about medications that could help him be comfortable when the time was right and to let them know when that would be. We spoke at length about his plan to stop eating and drinking. He often remarked that we only lease our bodies and that he didn't mind dying, that he had had a lovely life, had painted enough paintings, and caught enough fluke. He just didn't want to suffer needlessly. He expressed gratitude thoroughly and often for my support of his plan. I would have done anything to help him get out of the torture chamber his body had become. It was the last act of love I was able to lavish upon my lovely husband. I was eager to go join him in the plan, but again feared I would fade first and leave him alone and helpless, unable to move. We decided I'd better stick around until he was tucked away. When the family members from afar had visited, Jim stopped eating and drinking. My husband excelled at everything he chose to do even looking disheveled for hospice, even breathing his last exhale only six days after commencing his dehydration project. He had been dead to his own life for several months before he actually left it. I had grieved those losses with him for those months. There was a pulling feeling in the center of my body as I watched him struggle with the simplest movement. So we were able to grieve together in advance of his physical departure. By the, time we, by the time the senior Mr. Yardley himself, whose funeral home we mostly all try to avoid noticing as we drive past it, arrived in a beautiful blue suit and tie with his American flag lapel pin at 4 a.m. to wheel Jim gently away, I had already experienced the lowest dip of the, of the grieving curve. Imagining I was terminal my whole life also helped. Death comes as no surprise to the serious hypochondriac. Being a student of Buddhism also doesn't hurt. All things in a form are already coming apart. What I learned from Jim about death was that death is natural, as natural as an exhale, as natural as a cry from the maternity ward. Jim is not really dead. He is not any more dead than I am, than anyone is. He is as alive to me as he ever was. He might just as well be fishing right now in Akabanic Harbor or in Gardner's Bay. He's not in the same room as I am, though his ashes often are, but he is exactly the same in my experience of him as he always has been. I watched him take his last breath shallower and shallower and more quiet as midnight and then the morning minutes accumulated. Seeming even handsomer, even younger as his breathing quieted, I sat with him concentrating on his every inhale, every exhale. 
I imagined as I watched his face that I could see where he was going, that he could see where he was going. And he was concentrating with great focus on getting there. And it seemed as though it seemed to him to be a place of great peace. Each fading breath, quieter and quieter, punctuated another paragraph of my love for him. Jim taught me that death is as natural as the next exhale. And yet we spend our whole lives afraid of that next totally expected exhale. It was a privilege to help him, this man who loved solitude and inspired a blessed stillness with his presence and with his paintings. Take a breath now. Allow the exhale. Notice the stillness at the end of that exhale and rejoice with me in that stillness that was Jim's legacy. Um, before we end this, uh, that was, uh, was and is just one of the most moving tributes I've ever heard um, to, to Jim, who um, I knew 